So uh, a couple weeks ago, I'm, pro- I'm, I'm sure I'm probably the only one that this ever happens to, but I found myself um, scrolling, right, on social media and uh, watching funny videos. And, uh, and I get kind of sucked in sometimes, and I remember watching this video that caught my attention, and it was a, it was a video of, a, of this giant box that was placed in the middle of a square, and, uh, uh, and people walking all around it like a shopping square, and And uh, on the box, on the box was painted on the side a circus tent. And there was a sign on the bottom of the circus tent. tent. It was actually in a different language. I'm just assuming that the translation was correct. But it said, do not look inside. And there was a hole cut in the box about head high. And uh, so you see all these people walking by, of course. And uh, as they walk by, there there was loud like circus music, you know, playing out of the thing and laughing and you see people kind of look over at the box and and they read this you can see them looking down at the sign that says do not look inside and then they kind of look to see if anybody's paying attention and and then they get up to the box right and they look inside and as soon as they put their face in the hole they get pied wham they get smacked right which is hilarious to me because I'm watching the video right and probably to everybody else around there it was really really funny to watch but but an interesting thing happened as this video went on and person after person after person would walk up to the thing, read the, read the sign that says don't look inside, and then they would look inside and then they would get pied, right? Evidence on their face literally that they didn't read the rules or pay attention to the rules. And then they would get mad, right? They would get super mad. Like they start banging the box and kicking it. And there's this one dude that's like reaching inside the box trying to figure out who's in there. Like he's going to pull them out of the hole or whatever, right? And, and, and I use this story, this video, as, a, as a, a little bit of a point of levity as we ramp into our scene today in our text in Acts chapter 7. And the story of Stephen, which we've been tracking for several weeks now, uh, the scene in Acts 7, starting in verse number 54, a little bit less funny, right? Stephen, this leader in the church, this servant of the church, was falsely accused Right? So, so he's on trial before the Jewish Supreme Court, before the Sanhedrin, before this guy named Caiaphas, who was the high priest, on charges that were false. It tells us, it told us in the scripture today, were falsified. So he's there for no reason, nothing he did wrong, and yet he's on trial and, and, and falsely accused, poorly tried. He gave an overwhelming defense that we looked at over the past several weeks. He left his accusers without an excuse, literally like they had pie on their face. Everybody knew it. They couldn't deny it, right? And, and the reason for them having pie on their face was very obvious because it was their own fault. And so as we look at their response, we talked about this last week where Stephen dropped the hammer and said, you know, put all of the accusations back on them. The accused became the accuser. And as we look at their response to Stephen, Stephen's speech, similar to those who had been pied, it wasn't good, right? They got angry. And there's some specific things that we're going to see in Stephen's, the, the response to Stephen's speech, to his accusations brought against the high court as they stone him, as they kill him. There's going to be some specific things that we see in Stephen's death in relation to Jesus' death. An intentionally specific connection that that Luke makes between Christ's resurrection and what we celebrate today in Easter, the resurrection of Jesus. And if you're a note taker, I I invite you to to write down our big idea today. Jesus' resurrection redefines life. Okay, let me say that again. Jesus' resurrection redefines life. Life. We're going to be in Acts chapter 7, starting in verse number 54 through the end of the chapter. I'm going to read it, then we'll go back and kind of talk through some of the details, see how it applies to us. Acts 7, verse 54. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. They being the Supreme Court, Caiaphas and the others. Verse 55. But he, that's Stephen, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Stephen speaking, 
Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But, but they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And, they were stoned, and as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when they had said this, he fell asleep. Let's pray together. Father, today, as we look at your word, would you, uh, by your spirit, open our hearts, open our ears and our minds to what you would have to say. Holy Spirit, come and move in power. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we kind of just go back and talk through this text, a couple of different things I just want to point out. And in verse number 54, it says that, that, that they were enraged. Now, there's some key words throughout, but enraged is the first that we come across. This is not the first time we've heard the Sanhedrin, the high court, say that they were enraged. This is a, uh, the, the word diaprio in the Greek, which means to cut to the heart. I was actually reading a, 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 several commentaries about this. and One of the Puritan commentaries, he, they, they used the description rent with vexation. I just thought that was a cool phrase, right? Rent with vexation. They were enraged. They were outraged. Right? This is exactly how they responded to Peter back in chapter number five. When Peter, also on trial before the same court, gave a very similar, shorter, but very similar type of response, and the accused became the accuser. And it actually says in, in chapter 5, verse 33, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill him. So that was the first time that we see this high court enraged, and they wanted to kill Peter, but they recognized this may not look great, so they just beat them and let them go. Now... It happened again. Stephen, much longer response, but very similar response. And they are completely enraged. I don't know if you've ever heard the saying, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, what? Shame on me. This is number two, right? The first time they're like, okay, we're just going to beat them and let them go. But now it happens again. And they're like, man, we got to do something about this. So they do. Verse 55, full of the Holy Spirit. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, he being Stephen, gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. A couple of theological things that are just, I just want to point out, not, not to tarry too long on these things, uh, right? But, but first it says that he is full of the Holy Spirit. And I just want, to, I just want us to recognize that, that Stephen had already been described as being full of the Holy Spirit way back in chapter number 6, verse number 5. Right? So, so when it says that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit at this particular point, we're not talking about his salvation experience. Stephen had already come to faith in Christ and already received the Holy Spirit, which we believe when you place your faith and hope and trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells you. Right? This is the same thing that we look at in Earlier in the book, and with Peter in chapter number four, verse number seven, it says that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, right? And he, but but we know Peter was present on the day of Pentecost in chapter two, number verse number four. It says that when the Holy Spirit came, it indwelled them. So Peter had already received salvation, had already received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Yet in chapter four, he received a, a fresh filling, if you will, right? Uh, some, some freshness from the Holy Spirit to come and allow Peter to speak with clarity and to do the things that were right in front of him that God needed him to do. It's the same thing with Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, a fresh filling, a fresh dose to allow Stephen to do the things that God wanted him to do. And then it says that he looked into heaven, which everybody believes that this is just a gift from God, that God allowed Stephen a glimpse into the heavens, and he sees Jesus which is important, we'll come back to in a minute, but he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. This is, there's a lot of references to Jesus being at the right hand of the Father, but this is the only reference to Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Normally, Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Culturally, what would happen in this particular culture, first century, and in a trial or somebody bringing something up in a public setting, if you were to agree with that, you would stand. It was a way to show your approval, to show your support behind this person. Jesus symbolically standing, Stephen sees. 
verse 57, it says, for, there's three, three verbs here in verse 57 that they respond to Stephen saying, I can see heaven and I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. It says that they, being the Supreme Court, those around the Sanhedrin, they cried out with a loud voice. They stopped their ears and they rushed together at him. So they didn't want to hear from Stephen anymore. They cried out, they yelled, they screamed with a loud voice to overcome anything that he might say. They, they wanted to hear nothing more from Stephen. They had made up their minds. They stopped their ears, symbolically, again, kind of like covering your ears. I don't know if you guys remember one of the earliest uh, television shows I remember watching as a kid was Sesame Street, right? You remember Sesame Street? The fun little puppets that would walk around and Big Bird and all the things and and there's these two friends on Sesame Street, Bert and Ernie, right? You remember Bert and Ernie? And there was this bit that Bert and Ernie would do where, where Ernie usually had a banana in his ear. And Bert would kind of, you know, walk up behind the scenes because he was a puppet, right? And go, hey, Ernie, what's going on? And he would just look at him and just keep on going, not respond. And he would say, what's going on? And he would say, hey, I can't hear you. I have a banana in my ear. He's like, take the banana out. And he's like, I can't hear you. It's the same kind of thing, right? They stuck a banana in their ear. They didn't want to hear anything that Stephen might have to say. And it says, then they rushed together, right? They got together and they rushed. This is a, a very intense word, a very strong phrase in the Greek. This is the high court turned lynch mob, if you will. I, I grew up in West Texas. And uh, if you're in West Texas in the fall, there's this thing that we refer to now as Friday night lights. Right, Friday night lights in West Texas, everything is flat, and uh, you can see for a long way. Right, so you can see the glow of the Friday night lights, which represents Friday night football, which is a big deal in West Texas. Some of you may recognize the phrase Friday night lights from the movie or from the TV show entitled Friday Night Lights. That was actually patterned and taken off of a team in West Texas in Odessa, the Odessa Permian Panthers. Uh, they don't use that in the phrase, right, in the movies, but that's where it was patterned after, the Odessa Permian Panthers. The Odessa Permian Panthers were actually in my district. And so, so I grew up playing against the Odessa Permian Panthers, and when I was a younger teenager, my later elementary, early teenage years, this was in the Friday Night Lights era. And, and our, our school, the school that I would eventually go to high school and graduate from, played Odessa Permian Panthers on a regular basis. Our school was really good at the time. We were state semifinals, quarterfinalists, those types of things. But when I get into high school, not so much. Right? But here's the thing. What I learned when you have a rival like the Odessa Permian Panthers and you want to beat them, uh, only one game of the season matters, right? So you want to beat the, the Permian Panthers. And I remember distinctly my junior year, we played them and we go into overtime and it was in the double overtime that there was a fade to the back of the end zone that we catch and we win and we beat the Odessa Permian Panthers first time in about a decade. And here's what happened. Everybody went bonkers, right? And it was pandemonium and everybody rushed onto the field. And there's distinct and strict rules against this and I'm sure the school got in trouble in some capacity, right? But the overwhelming nature of everybody in the stadium and our football stadium sat about 20,000 people for a high school stadium, which is huge completely rushed the field. Like we were so excited. Everybody goes and we, and it just, it's just like the stadium erupted, right? There was no premeditation. There was no like pre-plan. It just happened. It was just our response, our immediate reaction. This is kind of the idea when it says that they rushed together at him. The difference was that ours was positive, right? This Time, not so much. It tells us in verse 58 that they cast him out or they drug him out of the city, and, which is kind of a funny little phrase because most of the time we skip right over that. But there's a Jewish law actually against stoning somebody in the temple or in the city. And so they would take them out. And so it was like, they're going to disobey all of the laws except for this one. We're going to kill this guy falsely against these false accusations. But we are going to go ahead and obey the laws to drag him out so we have the appearance of doing things the way that we're supposed to. They drag him out of the city. They took their garments off and they stone him. Now, we often think of stoning uh, maybe as 
something fairly quick. Um, big stones, maybe, you know, we're thinking resurrection day. The stone was rolled away. This is a giant stone that took a bunch of people. But what we're talking about here is a very long, painful, intentional death, right? Where they would take somebody outside of the city and then they would pick up rocks and of varying sizes, but rocks that they could intentionally and individually throw from maybe golf ball size to baseball size. And they would begin to hurl them at the person accused, the person condemned. They would take their jackets off to do this because they were throwing multiple times, right? And it says that they laid them at the feet of this young man named Saul, which is kind of in movie world, they call this an Easter egg, appropriately, right, today? An Easter egg of a hint of something that's going to come into play later on down the road, this young man named Saul, who it tells us in chapter 8, verse 1, that he agreed with this execution. And as they were stoning him, Stephen speaks, and he says two things. He says, Lord, receive my spirit. And then he says, don't hold this against them. And it tells us that he fell asleep. He died. It's a softer way to say that they killed him. So when, so when we take this story and we put it in the context of today and our series and what we're trying to understand and recognize that Jesus' resurrection redefines life, we see a lot of similarities between Stephen's life and Jesus' life. And, and Luke, the author of Acts, intentionally connects a lot of dots Right, so when we started Stephen's story several weeks ago, I said Stephen was the most Christ-like person that we've seen so far in the New Testament, and it's true. Right, Stephen was described, as was Jesus, full of grace, full of power, the Holy Spirit. Stephen served big, he loved bigger, he was falsely accused, unfairly tried, brutally and unjustly killed, just like Jesus. These two phrases... You know, facing death mimic what Jesus said on the cross. Luke records in chapter, Luke chapter 23, verse 46, Jesus saying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Stephen, here, chapter 7, verse 59, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, I know, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 34, Stephen says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Acts 7, 60. Here, here's... Here's the thing is there's so many parallels, but recognize that Stephen was not Jesus. Only Jesus was Jesus. Stephen was a follower of Jesus. He had committed his life to Jesus. Right? This wasn't, Stephen was all in, like completely 100% surrendered to following and believing who Jesus was and the work that he did on the cross. Everything pointed in Stephen's mind to Jesus being the Messiah. He had given all of it. And yet I continue to ask the question, why, right? The reason I ask the question, why, why did he do this? Why why is this story in here? Is because when we study a narrative passage in the scripture, it's very different than like, say, a letter to the church. A letter to the church, like Paul's letters, would give us specific instructions. Hey, do this and don't do this. The law would give us specific instruction. Wisdom literature, specific instruction. A narrative is just telling a story. So when we, when we read the story, if we only look at what's going on in the context there, then, then we have knowledge, but there's nothing life-changing about knowledge, right? We have to go, we have to apply this knowledge. And I apply it by asking questions, like why? <laughs> there's two primary things that I'm asking, why? Why would, why would Jesus die for this? Why would Stephen die for this? Right? And, if, and if Stephen was willing to die for this, why would he ask their forgiveness? Right? Why would he do that? Why does this make sense? So we'll just look at both questions first. Why would, why would Stephen willingly die for this, for Jesus, for this faith? Verse 56 said that Stephen saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Right? This wasn't... This wasn't giving Stephen a glimpse of Jesus in heaven. This wasn't just there so that Stephen would stand for his faith because he had already proven that he would do that. Right? This wasn't verification. This was, this, was, this was Jesus validating his actions. This is Jesus showing him, I truly am the Messiah. 
think about this. When, when Jesus looked up into heaven, he saw Jesus. I mean, sorry, when Stephen looked up into heaven, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. This, this wasn't uh, a likeness of Jesus. This wasn't a hologram or a hallucination, but this was real life. Jesus, And the only way that Jesus was in heaven is if he wasn't in the grave. Right? The father was pleased. The enemy had been defeated. Death had been overcome and Jesus had been raised and was standing at the right hand of the father. And Stephen was blessed with the opportunity to see him there. Because Jesus' death, Jesus' resurrection redefined life. Stephen's hope wasn't on the earth but in the eternal life that he had through faith in Christ. So why would, why would Stephen willingly die for Jesus? Because of the hope and the promise of the eternal life with Christ. Secondly, I ask the question, why would, why would, Jesus, I mean, why would Stephen ask Jesus to forgive the people who were killing him? That seems odd, right? So, so we might be able to get behind, why would I die for this? Because I believe so, so much in it, and I, and I love Jesus, and I'm willing to put him first, and I surrender all, right? But, but it's harder to get to a place where we say, hey, those that are killing us, God, would you forgive them? Right? So why did he say that? Why did, why did he want Jesus to forgive the ones that were killing him? Here's, here's the thing, only, only people who know the forgiveness of Jesus on a deep level can extend this sort of grace and forgiveness to others, right? Stephen knew the deep love and deep affection of Jesus. He knew that it, if Jesus could save a man like himself, Jesus could save those who were about to kill him. This Easter egg that Luke gives us, this mention of this young man named Saul, who would eventually become Paul, right? It says in 8.1 that Saul approved of Stephen's execution, right? Saul would eventually meet Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he would have this encounter with Jesus, and he would surrender his life to Christ. He would become known as Paul, and he would eventually become the greatest missionary in the history of, of the church. Which we'll look at in a few months, right? A few weeks. But is the fulfillment of this prayer that Stephen prays at his death. Father, forgive them. Don't hold this sin against them. And we see Saul's life, the birth of the, the missions movement in, in the church as a fulfillment of Stephen's dying request to forgive those who were killing him. Dr. J David uh, Jeremiah tells a story of a man named Houdini. And uh, Houdini at the time was known as the, the greatest escape artist in the world. He could escape anything. And he would do it publicly, and it was a, it was a circus-type act, if you will, right? They, they could put handcuffs on him, and Houdini would get out. A straight jacket with handcuffs, no problem. A jail cell, he once locked himself inside of a coffin and escaped. All within, like, under a minute, right? This was Houdini, the, the greatest escape artist ever known, right? There's only one recorded instance in which he failed to escape. Houdini was traveling in the British Isles. He goes to this small town, and because he was somewhat of a celebrity at the time, they, they all came out to greet him, and the mayor of the city, and all the things, and, and he gets invited to escape from their local jail. And so he kind of just goes along with it. They take him to the jail. He looks at the locks, and he thinks to himself, like, this is the simplest, easiest lock I've ever picked. Give me like 15 seconds, and I'll be out of this thing. So they put him in the jail, and they, they shut the door, and he begins to go to work, and 15 seconds go by, 30 seconds go by, 60 seconds go by, a couple minutes go by, and he's trying and trying and trying and still not unlocking the lock. He worked and worked and worked, and after two hours, as the story goes, trying unsuccessfully to pick the lock, he gives up. 
and exhausted and exasperated, Houdini leans against the door conceding defeat, and when he does, the door opens because it was never locked in the first place. Often, like the Jews of Stephen's day, we stay behind an unlocked door. Right? Jesus has unlocked the door to freedom, to restoration, to victory. All we have to do is lean on him. Dr. David Jeremiah says that one of the, one of the enemy's greatest deceptions is to convince us, like Houdini, that we have to work and strive to unlock the door of our salvation. To pick the lock by earning God's love by our good works and good favor and by doing good things. But really all we have to do is lean on Jesus and the door will simply open. Salvation is not what we do to save ourselves. Rather it's receiving what Jesus has already done on the cross to save you. Because Jesus' resurrection redefines life. Today on this Easter morning, I would say this, the most God-honoring, God-glorifying thing that we can do is to die to ourselves the way that Jesus died to himself on the cross. For the glory of the Father, for the salvation of mankind, we simply lean on him. Often we, we wonder, how, how can I, how, like there's so many things in my life, how, how can Jesus fix all of this? I don't know what it means to trust in him. How can I do this? How can I give up our sin? How can we give up our hurts and our pains? How can we give up a relationship or feelings that we're feeling or all of the things? And we get in our hole and we go, can God really do this? And all that we're trying to do is pick the lock that's already been opened. We just simply lean on Jesus, the one who can make all the wrong things right. Otherwise, we're going to continue trying and trying and trying to doing good and looking the part and coming and taking pictures at the photo booth on Easter and saying, he's risen, he's risen indeed, right? But we've never actually trusted in Jesus. And like Houdini, we'll never escape, we'll never succeed, just like those who killed Stephen. So I invite you today, holding nothing back, to simply lean on Jesus. To put your faith and trust and hope in Jesus, the one who can save. Who has the power and the authority, who paid the price on our behalfs for our salvation. Will you trust in Jesus today? One of the ways that we celebrate and trust, uh, celebrate somebody leaning in on Jesus is through baptism which is an awesome thing that we get to participate and we get to celebrate today in what what it means to be baptized. And when we celebrate somebody leaning into Jesus, somebody dying to themselves in baptism, in fact, Paul, the Apostle Paul that we see, who is Saul in this story, Paul who becomes a follower of Christ, launches the missions movement, writes to the church in Romans, in Romans chapter 6, and gives the most authoritative teaching on baptism that we find in the whole Scripture and in, in this symbolically what he says is when we're when we're baptized we're symbolizing our death to our sin we're symbolizing that we no longer trust in ourselves rather we're trusting in Jesus and Paul uses the phrase that we use during baptized baptism buried with Christ in through baptism raised to walk in newness of life Paul goes on to tell us in Romans 6 that a Christian must count himself dead to sin, but alive to Christ. And he implores us as followers, right? He implores us to to not let sin reign in our bodies any longer. Earlier I said the most God-honoring, God-glorifying thing that we can do is to die to ourselves the way that Jesus died to himself on the cross. The best way, I think the most obedient way for us to to celebrate that is through baptism, right? So I'm going to pray, and uh, we're going to watch and celebrate with the Pollock family as three of their children who've come to faith in Christ to get baptized today. And, and I just invite you, as you uh, watch and we experience and see, uh, celebrate this baptism, to just be reminded of yourself, 
Like, first, have you trusted in Jesus? Like, have you put your faith and hope and trust in Jesus? Have you died to yourself, if you will? And if you have, right, then, then are you letting sin reign in your body, as Paul implores us not to do, right? So y'all check out this video, then we'll see our baptism, and we'll get going. Hi, my name is Major Pollock. I'm here to get baptized and share my tes testimony. Well, I first started listening to Christian rap, which is kind of funny because my older brother Christian taught me about it and showed me about it. And it kind of helped me like learn more about Jesus. And that's what kind of started. It, it all started from there. And me listening to the rap helped me just want to read the Bible more. And, then I finally wanted to get baptized and show my dedication to God. So over the years, I've had opportunities to uh, be a part of a lot of different students coming to faith in Christ. And for varying reasons, this is the first time I've heard of rap um, being one of the reasons. But we're excited for major today as he professes faith uh, in Christ. We've got the Pollock family up here, which we're awesome. We're super excited to see Jason as one of our elders. And Jason is a neighbor to the Pollocks. He spent a lot of time with them and invested a lot in them. And uh, I personally have a back injury at the moment, so we're going to let Jason do our baptism. So major, before we do, let me ask you this. We've seen your testimony in front of all of our church. Major, have you Trusted in Jesus, have you given your life to Christ and are you committed to living for him? Yes, I have. Amen to that. All right. Yeah. share my testimony of how I accepted Jesus. I accepted Jesus when I was reading a book about a young lady in, in Sunday school with listening to her Sunday teacher. Her teacher told her that just because her parents were Christian doesn't mean that she is. And then I realized that I wanted to become closer to God so I started repenting of my sins and thanking him for everything he's given. This is my testimony and I'm here to get baptized. So uh, again, I love our videos. I love uh, unscripted letting each person tell their own story a little bit, a little bit of detail. So Jordan, in front of the whole church here, I, I ask you the same question I asked Major just a second ago. Have you given your life to Christ and are you committed to living for him? Yes. All right. My name is Serene, and I'm here to tell you guys why I want to get baptized. I watched a movie called Released from Shame. It kind of led me closer to God. And sometimes when I'm really mad or sad, I just think of Him, and it kind of calms me down. So I'm ready to accept Jesus into my heart. And I'm ready to show you guys today. 
Number three, here we go. Serene, I ask you the same question. Have you given your life to Christ and are you committed to living for him? We're super proud of you and super excited. So Jason, if you'll do the baptism.